Your space shapes your mindset and your expectations. We took for granted the effects that places and the transition between them have on us. The act of leaving home, of traveling, of walking into a place that has a specific purpose, it changes us. It makes us more ready to learn and work. And now COVID has so many of us stuck at home and now the school year is starting. So how can we as educators bring some of the structure and mindset of the real classroom back into the virtual classroom. I think we need to create a virtual space. Hi, I'm Mike, and I'm making this video aimed at teachers because I work with a lot of educators in my videos, and I've been getting a lot of questions from them, um, both about how to look better on camera as well as um, tools and techniques they could use to level up their remote class sessions. So I wanted to create a resource for both the teachers that I know and educators everywhere, and uh, I hope it helps you. Being a classroom teacher who needs to engage 30, 40, 50 young minds is a huge challenge, and it's a skill set all unto itself that I have a lot of respect for. And that was in person. And now they're faced with keeping and engaging their audience's attention remotely with minimal to zero budget. This is a daunting task. But know that I'm on your side and I want you to succeed. I'm going to share some techniques and apps that you can use that are low cost and not too complicated that I think will help you create the virtual space that you need in order to differentiate your remote class from every other Zoom call with family or friends that your students might be having. Without the structures of school and a classroom space, students are much more likely to lose focus and not retain your lessons. And, and this is true not just for teachers, but across the board, from small teams to big boardrooms. Everyone is struggling with this. There are three main points, so if you want to jump ahead, I'll make chapter markers for you. First, let's talk about looking and sounding good on camera. How lighting, sound, webcams, and backgrounds, they're all important to do this. Without it, you're going to look like, well, you know, we've all seen real professional people at their jobs look like they're in a cave, standing outside at noon in witness protection program in a horror movie or like an alien. And that's if everyone can connect to the software in the first place. Next, some ways to present information in these calls and videos that are engaging and that will help distinguish what your students see in your class from every other video chat with friends and family that they have. Introducing action, using virtual whiteboards, having a camera pointed at your hands for hands-on activities and sharing information, I'll also cover using your smartphone as a webcam if you don't have one, and show you some examples of what's possible. Last, I want to encourage you to take control of your video stream using a free program called OBS, or Open Broadcaster Software. That will give you the tools you need to be flexible and creative in your classroom to suit your teaching style. I know you've spent countless hours on lesson plans and project ideas, only to now have to translate them into a tiny video box on screen, but OBS can help you. And so it's worth the upfront commitment to get a bit technical and learn this skill. So OBS will let you split your screen between you and a presentation, add text and overlays, use multiple cameras at once, share your screen, or even just a single window or multiple windows. Every teacher that I've shown this has been amazed and they had no idea this was even possible. And now OBS has become a powerful tool for them. A quick disclaimer, I'm an independent video creator and I made this because I thought it would be useful for teachers and educators everywhere. No one paid or sponsored me to make this video. The product links in the description are affiliate links, and I get a teeny tiny percentage if you buy using those links, but it's at no cost to you. Let's get started. Looking and sounding good on camera. When you're on camera, everything the camera sees is your movie set. The more we can think in those terms, the less you'll look like somebody lounging around in their living room. But you don't need a studio lighting team to look good. You just need to understand two basic concepts. We want nice white light coming from your front, just above your eye line, and offset 45 degrees. If your room is really dark, you might want to turn on some of your regular house lights just to fill in the space a little bit. Number two, we want our light source to be big and diffuse. Flashlights and light bulbs are small, and they cast very harsh shadows. Windows and walls are big. Diffuse means soft shadows, the opposite of standing outside at noon. So the free option is to sit facing a window that has white shades or curtains. Just don't put that light behind you, or we won't see anything. 
It's not an option for everyone and not at night, but put it in your toolbox. Common household lights are usually yellow colored, and while they're easier on your eyes, they're dimmer and they can make you look off color or tired, especially if there's also daylight in your room. That's the most important thing. Don't mix light colors or your camera will have a hard time figuring out what's supposed to be white. White balance, it's a complex topic, but most cameras are set by default to adjust the image color to the best guess at what white is so that the skin tones will look natural, but they're not always successful. As you can see here, this yellow light on my left makes my skin look orange, and this white light on my right is making my skin look mostly normal colored. Uh, so here's that same example with the white balance changed, and now my left side looks natural and my right side looks blue. Um, and that's just because the camera is interpreting the colors differently. That's why I recommend bulbs that are daylight colored. This one is a 12 watt LED bulb at 5000 Kelvin. Kelvin is how they measure the color of light. You can get these or any bulb, incandescent or otherwise, at any hardware store or online for cheap. Daylight bulbs are also super bright. Uh, and you can use a lamp that you already own, like this floor light or a table lamp. If you don't have one handy, go to the thrift shop or get a basic clamp light at the hardware store for less than $10. And that'll make a world of difference. As for a diffuser, you might already have one. They're also known as lampshades. Just make sure that it's white, or you can make one at home out of paper, a thin cloth on one side, and aluminum foil on the other. And the bigger it is, the better. Option two is to get a really bright light and bounce it off of a white wall or a cloth or foam board. Just remember that the light changes color when it bounces off of things, so move away from shiny, bright colored things to avoid looking like an alien. If you want to go crazy, you could use something like the big light I'm using now, and it doesn't have to cost a fortune. You can get a bulb, a diffusion box, and a light stand for about 80 bucks. Next, take care of what's in the background according to how you want to be seen. Kids can see into your personal life and will get distracted by people or things behind you or moving around. Try putting your back to a wall or bookcase. <clears throat> uh, you can hang a sheet if you don't have an uncluttered space, and try to put some distance between you and your background to avoid casting shadows on the wall. And it also helps keep you in focus. Another simple thing you can do to make your scenes more dynamic can be as simple as this. You could set up in a corner, and you could have one view here for one type of scene, and then you can turn it into the corner, and then all of a sudden, you can mix up your space because a new background can add different context to a different section of your class or for making different points. People seem to really like these fake backdrops in apps like Zoom, but I think they look kind of tacky. I wouldn't go that route without a green screen, and unless you're prepared to turn your living room into a movie studio, I wouldn't go that route. Move your webcam back so that we can see as much of you as possible. Ideally, we'd like to see your head, torso, and your hands on the table, uh, but that's likely not possible unless you have a webcam that's separate from your computer. If you do have an external webcam, you can get a very inexpensive tripod to mount it on. Then you can push it back from you even further, and then we get a much nicer view. See, we can see my head, torso, and my hands on the table here. Not only is this more immersive and engaging, but it also helps to differentiate your class from any normal call. Raise your camera up to eye level by using a stand or even just like a shoebox like this, and you'll see that you get much closer to eye level. That's much nicer. Get a nice webcam if you can. Laptop and cheap webcams are just not ever going to look very good. Just be warned that webcams have been mostly sold out for months. So some stocks starting to come back, especially if you're willing to chance it on an off-brand one. The gold standard is the Logitech C920. You've probably seen one before. It has everything we're looking for. A great 1080p HD camera, great microphones, a wide angle of view. Unfortunately, scalpers in high demand have driven up the price on these more than double. They used to cost about 50 bucks. I'll link to a few alternatives below. If you happen to have a DSLR camera, you may be able to use that as a webcam via USB. Just look up your model. Or if you have a camera that can output to HDMI, uh, this $20 capture card works pretty good and you can plug your HDMI into that and then into USB, and then you have a webcam. Honestly, the best option during quarantine is probably using your phone as your webcam or as a handheld cam using software. But there are some drawbacks, and I'll talk about that more later. Let's talk about sounding good. This used to be hiding off camera. If your students can't hear and understand you, then there's no class. 
and you'd be surprised how much good audio can make something sound high quality, even if a video doesn't look that good. I find people are quite forgiving of bad video if it sounds okay, but if you look great and sound bad, people will run for the doors. Aside from investing in a good mic or a webcam with good mics in it, here are some free things you can do. In general, the closer you are to the mic, the better that you sound. Headsets can be nice, but they can look a little bit funny. Headphones will prevent echo without fail if you're having problems with that. Otherwise, just try not to have your speakers too loud or too close to your microphone. Start with what you have, like these iPhone headphones or your laptop or tablet's built-in microphone. Take a recording and then compare what they sound like with some headphones on. Take a recording and then compare what they sound like with some headphones on. Audio nerds can go on and on forever about this stuff, but mainly we're listening for static or distortion. Uh, distortion is usually caused because the sound is too loud for the microphone. Uh, we're listening for how muffled or underwater the microphone sounds. Uh, remove any barriers between you and the microphone, get closer, uh, but it can mostly be a property of just cheap microphones. Listen to just how clear your voice sounds. Your students will hear you potentially for hours a day, and so do you want to sound like this? Today, we have a feast for the ears. Prepare your cochlea. Or do you want to sound like this? Today, we have a feast for the ears. Prepare your cochlea. Eliminate or deaden background noises like air conditioning by closing doors or putting a towel to close gaps. Again, an external keyboard and mouse can help to avoid these sounds, especially from built-in mics. Most chat software will help remove some background noise, but do what you can to minimize it. Another general concept is that fabric and soft things are good for sound, and hard surfaces tend to bounce sound around and make it harsh and echoey. Clap your hands in the middle of your room and listen for an echo. If it echoes, try to add some soft things like rugs, curtains, or pillows nearby. You don't have to spend a bunch of money just to get started, but consider using DonorsChoose.org or similar platforms to raise money to invest in some basic gear if you're going to be doing this in the long term. And you know this, but it's worth underlining. No amount of cameras or fancy tricks can save you if every class starts with technical problems, searching around for the right setting. Preparation and practice are the only solution to that. Making distance learning more classroom-like. I know plenty of teachers who spend a huge amount of time, money, and effort into making their classroom look and feel just right for their personal style and needs. But beyond just the look, in order to create your classroom in this virtual space, let's look at some things you can do to separate your class from feeling just like a casual call and make it feel more engaging for your students. Consider Bob Ross, the famous TV painter. Why do so many people like to watch him paint and just make little comments? There's not really much happening there. Of course, part of that is charisma. But the other big piece is that it's active. It gives us action on screen that we can see come to life. And even if these are small actions, humans are animals that love to watch other humans do stuff. Look at the bajillion dollar TV movie biz if you don't believe me. Get up and move. This will not only introduce action and movement to your classes, but I'm sure many of you are more used to this style of being up and moving. This will help keep your energy up, encourage your students to move, and make your class more dynamic overall. But there is one barrier, as you can see. A simple solution is to prop your computer up on some boxes. That'll bring it closer to eye level, and then move back. In order to do this, you may want to invest in a lav mic. You can get one for as little as $20. I'll put some links below. A lot of you probably have hands-on projects that you'd like to do, or even just printed information that you want to share. But holding things up can be both tiresome and hard to see. If you have a movable webcam, you could have a little setup like this to hang it from. You can get an arm like this for about $14, I'll put a link below, and these things can come in really handy. They're normally for microphones, but they can hold up to one kilo, and they're great for mounting on cameras. You can even use your smartphone in this way. There are also tripods you could rest on the table. But Mike, you ask, how am I supposed to get not one, but two webcams? If only we had a very powerful, excellent camera on hand. This brings us to using your phone as a camera. There are a few different ways to do this, and each one has benefits and drawbacks. If you search online for how do I use a phone as a webcam, you'll find a lot of answers. I'm going to recommend a program called Erion. 
It works across platforms, Android, iPhone, Mac, Windows, etc., and it's free. Go to erian.com. I'll put a link below. Download the software onto your computer and then do likewise for your phone from the Apple or the Play Store. Now, just start the Erian program on your computer, launch the app on your phone. We can adjust our settings here. I would go for 1080p, um, but uh, 720 is okay, uh, especially if you're not gonna show the video full screen. In order for this to work, you'll need your computer and your phone to be on the same Wi-Fi network. All right, and there we go. My iPhone is a webcam. All right, so I've got my phone now as the webcam hooked up to my arm using this little iPhone holder. And uh, now I've got my whiteboard here. Uh, a few alternatives to Erian include using QuickTime. Uh, that's, of course, if you're on a Mac and have an iPhone. Uh, DroidCam works very similar to uh, Erian. It's free, but it seemed a little flaky to me, and it's a bit more technical. Lastly, Air Server. Now that's a paid app. Uh, it costs about $12 with an EDU email, but it turns your computer into essentially a fake smart TV that any device can cast to, or even multiple devices at once. It's very cool, links below. However, there is one small hitch. I don't recommend using your primary phone as a webcam for hours and hours every day because it ties up your phone for one, but it can also get very hot and suffer wear and tear. So it's a great solution for the short term, or if you have an extra phone lying around, it doesn't need to have service, just Wi-Fi, um, or for more occasional use like this as a hand cam. You can also turn down the camera's resolution and that can help with the heat. But with it set up like this, you can show a project in detail, use it as your desktop whiteboard. Reminds me of the old days of overhead projectors, uh, for better or worse, I guess. Even though it sounds a bit boring at face value, Of course, you can also go digital with a virtual whiteboard. All the major platforms have these built in, and there are also standalone apps. We may not be able to see you anymore, but we can still see the ideas come to life, and you might be surprised how much more interesting this can be than even a slick PowerPoint. Just look at Saul Khan of Khan Academy. To make a virtual whiteboard work well on your computer, I recommend you invest in a pen tablet to be able to actually write in your own handwriting. Wacom is the brand that most people trust. This one was about $100, but you can get a used one or an off-brand one starting from about $40. If you have an iPad or another tablet already, you can write on that and then share the screen. Or... Dot, dot, dot. You can combine a whiteboard, a presentation, and your camera feed all together using a program called OBS. This is the technical part, but you don't need to be a tech whiz. Just open to learning a little bit of this powerful skill. Ask for help if you need it, and remember you can pause this video and go back if I move past something too quickly. So whether you're using Zoom, Teams, Google Meet, Discord, it doesn't matter. They all have some basic functions. They take your webcam and your microphone, and they share it with your room full of whoever you're talking to. So what do we do if we want some more power? We introduce a middleman between your camera and the video chat program. And that middleman is called OBS, which stands for Open Broadcaster Software. It's totally free, open source, no strings attached. Side note, you know all those kids streaming video games for other people to watch that maybe you don't really see the appeal of? Well, we have them to thank indirectly for this being such a mature and free program. So OBS will let you split your screen between you and a presentation, add text and overlays, use multiple cameras at once, share your screen, or even just a single window or multiple windows. Now, this is a deep topic and I can't cover everything here. And you don't need to know everything about this either. I just wanted to give you enough to get started, get this set up, and that should be enough to get you ready to go for your classes. I'll put some online resources below and potentially cover more in-depth topics in the future. Step one, go to obsproject.com and download OBS for your operating system. Mine is Windows in this case. 
click on the download and install it like you would any program. I'll put these links in the description. When that's done, we can move to step two, opening OBS for the first time. You'll likely see this little prompt here uh, asking you if you want to use the auto setup wizard, and that's probably a good idea. Uh, so we don't need to worry about any of the streaming stuff. We're not going to be touching that. So I set mine for recording. Set your base canvas resolution. That probably should be the same as whatever your screen is. Most laptops and devices are 1920 by 1080. FPS stands for frames per second. Um, you probably don't need 60, so I would go for 30. Okay, and we just click apply. All right, step three, creating your first scene. So a scene is a screen setup that you can switch to between your class. So let's start with something really simple. Let's add a scene that's just your webcam and mic. We're gonna add a scene calling it my face. And then I'm gonna to go to sources, click on the plus icon, video capture device, and call that webcam. So right there, you see that's my integrated laptop webcam, the nose cam, and I'm gonna change that to my external webcam. I find it's a good idea to click on this resolution FPS, go to custom, and then set the resolution to 1080p, 1920 by 1080, or whatever your camera supports. Say okay, and there we have it. So this will be just like a normal video call, and whatever you see in this preview window here is what's going to be sent out to your call. But let's say you wanted to add your name, or the name of your class in the lower left-hand corner. Okay, I'm gonna do that by clicking add, text, my name, and then typing in Mike Shaw. And then you can use this uh, font tool to select to whatever fonts and styles that you like. I'm gonna leave it at its default for now. And then I'm going to drag this down to the lower left. And using the little red dots here at the corner, I can click and drag to resize it to a more manageable size. All right. You could even do the same thing with an image by going to add, image, and browsing your desktop for the file. Okay, I'm gonna resize that down and put it in the upper left-hand corner. This would be great if you have something you wanna share with your class, or maybe for younger students, if you have signifiers or mascots for when it's quiet time, when it's play time, when you wanna change activities, things like that. All right, we've done this work. So now how do we get it into Zoom or other software? Step four, your virtual camera. All right, one more thing to download. We're gonna to go to this link Click on the source code. I'm gonna go and take the Windows installer and click it, and it'll install just like any other program. Just leave everything at its default and click Finish. Okay. Once you restart OBS, you should see under Tools, Virtual Cam. Okay, we're just gonna to wanna to start that. You also have the option of clicking Auto Start so that it'll begin every time you open OBS. If you're gonna be using it for this a lot, I'd probably recommend doing that. And click Start. Okay, now you can close that window. Don't click stop, close it. And now when we go into our chat program, you should see OBS camera listed as an option. And there we are. As you can see, a lot of video chat programs will automatically flip your webcam. So um, we can either go to video settings and say, and uncheck mirror my video. That's the easiest way. You can also change the setting in OBS by going to tools, virtual cam, and then to say horizontal flip. Now we can start building out your virtual classroom. All right, I'm gonna get rid of this text by just highlighting it and pressing minus. It'll say, are you sure? Yeah, we don't need that. Okay, now I'm gonna click on my face, the scene, not my face, my face. Right click and go to duplicate. And now we're going to name this present. All right, I'm gonna add a PowerPoint presentation, but the same idea applies for any presenting program or really any window on your computer that you have open that you'd like to share, whether it's a whiteboard or a website or whatever you'd like. So now I'm opening up PowerPoint to this extremely generic slide, and I'm gonna make sure that my window is set to maximize, not full screen, and put it into view mode, which is this second from the right view like that. Normally you'd present things in full screen, but it introduces some complexities into OBS and uh, a topic for another time. But now when I go to add, I'm gonna add a window capture. And I'm gonna call that PowerPoint. See, there we go. So if it's not selecting it automatically, this top option here is all the windows that you have open. And 
Now, next time when you start your program or go to this scene, it will look for a similar title or matching title and say, okay. All right, I'm gonna resize this because it's a little too big. Now you can see there's a little bit of extra gunk around this. So if that's the case for you, we can hover over these little red boxes, hold Alt, and that will crop the image to whatever size that you want. So if there's anything that you don't want to have seen, that's what you do for any window, including your webcam. All right, so now I'm gonna drag this into the upper left-hand corner. When I advance my PowerPoint slides, you'll see in OBS that it's broadcasting this screen here. And when we go back to Zoom, you'll see, ta-da, there it is, your PowerPoint slides in all their glory. I would recommend definitely making sure that the text is big if you plan to minimize it like this. Or we can do the alternate. So if I want to duplicate present again, I can call this present small face. And now I'm going to switch these two around. I'm going to make the PowerPoint big and myself small by just dragging in the corner, making myself small, dragging the PowerPoint to make that big. And then you can see that, oh, I disappeared. On the sources list here, they are in the order that they are shown. So if my webcam is below my PowerPoint, it won't be seen. So I'm just gonna click and drag it up, and there I am. So if you wanted to do this way, you could design your PowerPoint slides or whatever so that there is a blank space in the lower left or top left or wherever you wanna put it. And now they can still see your face, they can still engage and see the actions that you're moving, but also have a much clearer view of your PowerPoint presentation. Now, word of caution, when we change the PowerPoint window size, like if I unmaximize it here, it'll also change in OBS. That's why I recommend setting up your presentations in a way that's fixed, that is reliable. So in this case, that's why I say, go ahead and maximize it, and then it will always be the size of your screen and you won't have to change it. Side note, having a second monitor makes this a lot easier because you can have OBS and your notes on one side and your presentation on the other and only share one screen and keep all your secret teacher stuff on the other. A word of caution, for really, really realsies, whenever possible, share windows and not your whole screen. Window sharing will keep notifications and other troublemakers from appearing. Even if you're careful, even if you have nothing to hide, there are still things that you probably don't want to broadcast out to the world. And we've all heard the horror stories of people who were not careful. Putting it together, so I'm in my video call or presentation teaching my class, and now I have the power to swap between all these scenes on the fly by just clicking on them. You can even set them up as hotkeys by going to File, Settings, and Hotkeys, and here's where it gets really fancy. So I'm gonna set up my face to be Control-1, set up Present to be Control-2, and Video Present to be Control-3, okay. You've probably seen me sneakily reaching under here to press buttons on during this video, and that was me changing scenes. Let me show you how cool and professional this feels. <laughs> Hoppering over into Zoom, I'll put on my fake class presentation that's about lighting for some reason. Let's talk about the key things you should understand about lighting. Control 2. Light your face from the front, offset 45 degrees with daylight color, diffuse light. And we don't want to mix normal lights with daylight because they can make you look weird, okay? Let me show you a quick example. Three. Look at this video of me. As you can see here, this yellow light on my left makes my skin look orange, okay. and, and this okay. white light on my right. Pause. Do you see how, depending on the camera's color balance, a shot can look vastly different? One. Imagine the kind of flexibility you can have, as well as a much more interesting virtual space to work in. But remember to practice and go in prepared for your first few times. If you're working in an asynchronous way, you can easily record videos in advance to share with your students using OBS. In the lower right hand corner, you would just click on start recording, and then you would talk and use your scenes you've set up, and then click stop recording when you're done. This file should go to your videos folder by default. This can save you from having to edit a video after the fact. Just be sure to add your audio sources like your microphone and desktop audio and do some testing. I hope this helps teachers and educators level up their remote teaching game. We're all being thrown into unfamiliar situations in troubled times. But if you make your virtual classroom more engaging and visual, your students will not just pay more attention, but they're gonna have better educational outcomes. If you found this helpful, please share this video to other teachers, like and subscribe to my channel, 
feel free to ask me questions in the comments. A lot of my previous videos are for the nonprofit Steamhead, so I'll link to that channel as well as to my website if you'd like to see my other work. Thank you, goodbye, and good luck.